Well, hello and good morning. So um, on the screen here, you should see myself and um, my, uh, my name is Heather Richard. I'm not Amy Hynote. So um, I know Amy is really disappointed. She is not here introducing uh, us this morning with day two of the conference. Um, day two was, was amazing and uh, she lost power late last night. So here we are uh, moving into day one. Um, again, my name is Heather Richer. I am not Amy Hynote, <laughs> even though I've said that on the screen. Um, our, our thoughts go out to all those in the middle of the hurricane. She did text, I think everything's okay, just without power. So um, joining us this morning, uh, Dr. Kelly McGuire uh, is gracing us with her presence for this keynote. We're gonna tag team on here. And um, I've known Kelly for over 10 years, I would say. Um, and when Amy called me and asked about, you know, who are other revenue experts that would be great additions to this conference? Kelly was one of the first people that came to mind, of course. Um, not only because she's super smart, but also because she's uh, a great presenter and a ton of fun. So um, Kelly has written two books on revenue management, um, and she has her PhD uh, in revenue management. And um, Kelly, maybe I'll let you take it from here and say a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, happy to do it, Heather. Thanks for having me. Thanks to Amy. I know it's, um, boy, I tell you what, just when you think 2020 <laughs> couldn't deal us another hand, <laughs> we're just rolling with it. So. <laughs> Well, it is absolutely um, my pleasure to be here with all of you doing one of my favorite things, although I must say I am more used to doing this um, in front of a live audience. This is my first go at a virtual presentation. So, um, so you know what, what, with 2020, we're rolling with the times. Um, I am the managing principal for hospitality at ZS. ZS is a mid-sized global consulting company focused on delivering analytically driven strategies and solutions to the commercial function. And my practice at ZS focuses on revenue management in hospitality, kind of the broader definition of hospitality, of course. And so I help my clients evolve and innovate in their revenue management practice to continue to drive profitable revenue in the face of whatever the world throws at us, which has been kind of an interesting journey here in 2020 for sure. Um, I am also, uh, in my spare time, um, the commercial advisor for a professional property management company startup um, called Urbane Hospitality Group. And you will certainly be hearing more about Urbane in the months to come. Um, lots of exciting stuff happening in your space, and I'm really excited to be a part of it. But today, Amy and Heather asked me here to talk about components of revenue management, um, which obviously a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, but as we were prepping for the call, Amy just said, you know what, Kelly, I think most of us just wanna know just what the F is revenue management anyway. And I said to Amy, I think that I've been waiting my entire career to deliver a presentation called what the F is revenue management anyway. And so, um, and it's mostly because I've spent my career in revenue management and I get this question all the time. And um, always very happy to try to further the charge for revenue management. When I was starting out though, I was a little bit challenged. And the big challenge I had actually was trying to explain what I did to my mother. Now, my mother is extremely smart um, and very savvy, but she doesn't know a lot about the hotel industry. So when I started out my career in academia and, and learning about this discipline, um, you know, I learned a pretty, I mean, I gave her this definition. Um, this is, you know, if you look on Wikipedia, uh, or if you read Robert Cross's book, uh, this is kind of the technical definition of, of revenue management. And I very proudly used, pronounced all these words correctly. And um, I kind of realized as I saw the look on my mother's face that this is a very technical definition. It's technically correct, um, but it uses a lot of kind of, you know, technical words. And um, my mother went away from this basically telling all her friends that her daughter worked on computers. So I hadn't quite nailed it yet with mom. Um, I thought really long and hard about it. And I said, okay, I'm going to put my management consultant hat on and I'm going to explain what revenue management is through revenue management theory, provide a framework for thinking about revenue management. Um, now revenue management is a specialized pricing application that is suited best for industries that meet these following five necessary conditions. So first they have to have fixed capacity. So you think about kind of airlines 
only 200 seats on the plane, hotels, 200 rooms in the hotel, 300 rooms in the hotel, and it is difficult or costly to add more capacity. So that's condition number one. Number two, perishable inventory. If the flight takes off with an empty seat, you lose the opportunity to sell that seat. If the night passes at the hotel and you have an empty room, you lose the opportunity to sell that room. You can't put the product on the shelf to sell it the next day. Also, there has to be segmentable demand. So different customers need to have different value for that perishable inventory at different times. So the classic example is business versus leisure travel. So back in the early days of conceptualizing this in airlines, you know, business travelers needed access to the product um, in the short term when they needed it, and they were willing to pay a premium for that access. Whereas leisure travelers, being more price sensitive, uh, they were willing to accept conditions on the purchase, like purchasing 21 days in advance or staying over a Saturday night in exchange for a discount. There also has to be a low cost of sale. So this is important because you want to be able to vary that, that pricing um, but a low cost of sale really means it doesn't cost that much to sell one more unit of inventory compared to the high fixed cost of operating the business. So how much does it really cost to put another passenger on the plane once you've already paid for the fuel and the crew? Um, anything that you get from that additional sale will offset those high fixed costs and, um, and drive profits. So low cost of sale. And then finally, advanced reservations. So bookings come in advance and you want that um, those advanced bookings because you want to be able to plan out how much inventory you will reserve for that most valuable demand and be able to say no to some reservations in anticipation of more valuable demand coming later. So this is kind of the theory of revenue management as put forward by um, Kimes and Chase, Sherry Kimes, my PhD advisor back in 1998. And if you look at any sort of industry, you can kind of go through these necessary conditions and figure out if this specialized pricing technique applies to you. And after that speech, my mother nodded her head politely and went and told her friends that I work in computers, probably in hotels, but maybe airlines, she still wasn't sure. So I, you know, went right back at it and, and uh, tried again. And this is the sort of classic business definition. So I thought, you know, when I was at MGM as SVP of revenue, people asked me what I did internally, and this is what I would tell them. Yeah, this is the classic right, 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 right definition. Um, it's usually attributed to Robert Crandall back in the 80s when um, American Airlines started revenue management. Um, and it's evolved over time and it's been co-opted by a lot of industries. But at, at a basic level, I thought, yeah, this is what this is what revenue management does. By this point, mom wasn't listening anymore because it hadn't really resonated with her. And um, this bothered me, of course, because um, I'm so passionate about what I did that I really I wanted to nail it so I thought and I thought and I thought and um, and then I finally gained some inspiration as I thought back to kind of the beginning days of revenue management and what I was doing at that time and I thought to myself you know what revenue management is a lot like a big game of Tetris and then I thought nailed it um, okay actually I think I might have jumped the gun on the boom let me let me walk you through this um, <laughs> The fail-safe analogy for um, what it is that a revenue manager does all day. So if you remember back um, to your Tetris playing days, I think a lot of us played that um, obsessively. The goal of Tetris, goal of any video game, is a high score. And it's really to, you know, maximize your score, maximize revenue. And you do that by fitting pieces into the limited capacity of this game board so that you leave as a few empty spaces as possible. And when you fill up the entire row, you get points. And when you fill up four rows at a time, you get tons of points. So this is a lot like how a revenue manager moves pieces around, pieces of demand around to most efficiently utilize the capacity, their limited capacity. And if you think about it, the pieces in Tetris, um, they're all different shapes, they're all different sizes, they come in different patterns, and they are more or less valuable to you at different times. Sometimes you're just dying for a square, and other times that sort of wonky S block is exactly the perfect piece that will clear the row and fit in, fit in that space and drive that high score. This is segmentable demand, different patterns, different value, different times. So the job of a revenue manager really is to manipulate and move those pieces 
um, every day, all day to continue those pieces of demand to continue to fill that limited capacity. So if you think about that picture on the left, probably we're gonna flip that, um, flip that S piece and scoot it over to the left and drop it right in that spot um, and then continue to move on to the next piece. Now, what made Tetris start to get a little bit more fun um, back in the day when I was playing was when Tetris got, you know, I'm realizing I'm dating myself here, whatever, we'll move on. <clears throat> when Tetris introduced the next function, because then not only could you figure out what you were gonna do with the piece that was coming, but you could do that in the context of what you knew was coming next. And the more next pieces that were introduced, the better you could plan. Revenue managers spend a lot of their day making forecasts, looking into the future, trying to predict what's gonna come next so that they can better plan out how they're going to manage and manipulate that demand to fill up that limited capacity. And so this is why forecasting is so important in revenue management, why they do, why they spend a lot of time thinking about that forecast so they can plan to fill in all those empty spaces. And I remembered back to my Tetris playing days and I always thought, you know, if the one thing that one function that I really wanted Tetris to introduce was maybe the ability to ask for, maybe in exchange for a little bit of, of a few points, the piece that I really needed to fit um, to fill my to fill those empty spaces and drive my high score. So if you think about that picture on the right, what if as a player you could ask for a bunch of I pieces instead of that L piece, and maybe you wouldn't get full points for that, but you still could drive your score and drive that revenue. And that is equivalent to how revenue managers today work with marketing. They know what um, demand spe demand patterns they need. And so they can work with marketing to help marketing go out and proactively source that demand. And okay, I think it's time. Once I explained this analogy to my mother, who was as Tetris obsessed as I was, she understood perfectly what revenue management was. So with this analogy in mind, the next time anyone asks what you do, they're a Tetris fan, there you go. Um, so Really, if you um, when we think about back in the early days, revenue management was a lot like this, um, this simple game of Tetris. Back in the 90s, late 80s and early 90s, when it started uh, back in hotels and airlines, we talk about hotels and airlines a lot because you know they were the industries that really invented revenue management. Revenue management really was, and it, it was a capacity management or an inventory optimization problem. So in the 90s, when revenue managers came to work dressed like this, um, we were maximizing revenue from the limited capacity by opening and closing rates according to forecasted demand. So you needed that, you need to anticipate what was coming and then you just set rates according to what you, what you saw coming. Very much a capacity management problem. And there were other techniques um, that both airlines and hotels as they started to really think about how to best utilize that capacity started to emerge. So we started to see things like overbooking, to, um, to cover for no-shows or unutilized inventory. Um, back before customers had to secure a reservation with a prepayment, um, they could no-show with no penalty. And so um, you, could have, you could see a sold out night at the hotel and end up going down with empty rooms that you got no revenue for, even though you knew there was demand out there. So by forecasting um, that no-show or cancellation rate, you could cover um, for those anticipated no-shows by um, booking above capacity levels. Drove a lot of value in both airlines and hotels in the early days. The other thing that really drove a lot of value in early days was um, for hotels in particular were length of stay controls. And this is still true today. Um, understanding what demand was by length of stay so that you could make sure that you were optimizing revenue across um, all patterns instead of just one night at a time. So if you think about this, um, hotel might have a lot of demand for one night stays on a Saturday. You could fill the hotel with one night stays on a Saturday. But on Friday, everybody who's coming wants to stay for two nights. So if you'd said yes to all those one night lengths of stay on Saturday, you end up with a full hotel on Saturday and an empty hotel on Friday. So by cleverly using length of stay controls, you can make sure that you're preserving space for those two night length of stays. So you're optimizing revenue both on Friday and Saturday, consider, considering demand for both nights. Now, as you can imagine, this problem gets very complicated when you think about every possible stay pattern across every possible date and the booking horizon. This problem gets really hard if you're trying to forecast demand at that granular level. This problem gets really hard if you're trying to forecast that no-show rate. 
requires a lot of data, requires some analytics. And that was the other thing that industry learned very early on um, was that, back to this technical definition again, this um, discipline would always be a heavy user of data, of analytics, and of technology. And in fact, as revenue management has evolved over time, it is the constraints around data, technology, and analytics, um, and the opportunities around data, analytics, and technology that have driven um, innovation or restricted growth of, um, of the industry. And so um, I'm gonna give you an example kind of from the hotel days to really drive this point home. But the dependency on that data and technology has dictated how revenue management has evolved over time. So if you think about kind of early days of hotel technology, there wasn't a lot of technology available in the hotel. There's probably just enough to take a reservation and charge the guests for the stay after very much about control, um, financial controls. And even with the evolution of the GDSs, all that was happening there in the background was extending the reach of the property to, um, to be accessible to more travel agents to grow bookings. Um, very much kind of behind the scenes um, from that perspective. Didn't really facilitate a lot of capture and usage of that data. So it wasn't until the property management systems evolved and the central reservation systems came on the scene that enabled um, really three things. First, instant bookings. Um, so if you had an instant confirmation of the booking, then you had real time information about your availability. So that real time availability information, knowing what your, um, what, uh, your reservations on hands were and how much you had left to sell um, in real time enabled uh, a more clever management of that capacity. Um, and then the third thing, of course, was the ability to actually change prices um, at, uh, uh, with some flexibility um, through these systems and broadcast those prices. So here's where revenue management really gained momentum in hospitality. It was manual before this, but it, we started to think more, um, more analytically and more broadly. But it really was at that time about this inventory optimization, about opening and closing rates based on forecasted demand. But the technology constraint um, was finally lifted when we had that instant booking to really manage those prices in a very dynamic way. And then of course, um, everything changed and the whole paradigm shifted in the 2000s uh, when the, with the advent of the internet and um, any e commerce and the OTAs. So here were some more opportunities and constraints on the problem and the problem evolved. So with the internet, guests now suddenly had access to every, directly to every rate in the market. And so instead of just thinking about your demand and the impact on your demand, you started, you really needed to start thinking more directly about competitor pricing and the price sensitivity of your demand and the customer willingness to pay. And so the problem shifted from one of just inventory optimization to actual price optimization, considering that willingness to pay. Also a really big constraint was um, imposed on revenue management at this time with the advent of the OTAs, and that was uh, price parity. And so revenue managers lost the ability to vary price by channel um, according to the value and cost of that channel and, and had to offer the same rates across every channel. So it changed the way um, that price was deployed um, and the way you had to think about how price was calculated. And then again, um, just as fast as technology moves um, in the 2010s with the advent of the social web, now there's all of this big data, more data for revenue management to think about. And so it's not just price anymore, it's the opinions of all of the previous travelers that have stayed at the property um, that need to be balanced against each other, um, really usher, ushering in an era of value transparency. And revenue managers had to now think more broadly about how their perceptions of the quality of their property balanced against their, um, their price to impact demand. And you heard Brefney talk about that a little bit yesterday. She and I actually did some original research on this that's in my book, um, shameless plug for both of us. Um, but really, again, expanding the levers um, and complicating the problem. And then of course today, you know, we've got things like mobile bookings, which shrinks the booking window um, and your ability to, uh, to plan ahead. And of course, all of the um, ideas around internet of things, um, location data, just more data, more opportunity, that's gonna keep putting pressure on the problem. And revenue management, you know, with all of this complication, with all of the new influences, 
and dealing with all these technology constraints, lands in 2020, armed with all of the tools that they had developed over time, ready to face the slings and arrows of the digital economy, and one kind of snuck through. Um, I love this uh, analogy because just when you think you're prepared, um, you know, something else gets uh, gets thrown at you. And um, certainly what we're facing here in 2020 is actually bringing to light, in, in my view, the full scope of the job of revenue management and the full importance of understanding all of the levers that are available to you. Um, a lot of folks think about revenue management as being a lot about price. And I did talk a lot about price today. Um, and it is. Ultimately, you are setting the prices that drive profitable revenue for your property. But price is only one of the many levers. And I would argue that in 2020, price is probably our weakest lever at this point. Simply discounting right now is not going to be a primary driver of demand. There are a lot of other factors to consider. And so if you're just dropping price right now, you could potentially be diluting um, your, your revenue and not stimulating demand the way you want to. You have to be very clever about how you think about all of those rights that were in that, um, that right, right, right definition. Who are the customers that are traveling? What are their travel needs? And how are they interacting with your product? What channels are you reaching guests through? And do you have the opportunity to use the characteristics of that channel um, to help drive that valuable demand um, and to manage it appropriately? Um, think about product right now. The way that customers are using our product is different. And is the product being positioned properly do you understand um, the aspects of it that drive value for customers now so that you can align pricing with that? And time is a big factor. We saw that a lot yesterday. Um, booking windows are shortening. If you start discounting um, on, on your normal booking window now, you could just be discounting too early and you're gonna end up diluting revenue as we move into the booking window. So if you don't understand all of these aspects and all of these levers, you're just not gonna be effectively revenue managing your property. Revenue management is much more than price. Um, and in fact, uh, I love this quote from one of my favorite revenue leaders. She gave this to me for my book um, back in a uh, couple years ago, and it's still very true today. Um, it's not just about pricing today. It used to be that you could put a pricing strategy in the market and shift behavior, but there's so much more information out there. There's so much more competition for the consumer's attention. Um, and there are a ton of other influences on behavior. So price alone is not is not sufficient um, to, to, really, to really be effective in revenue management. You need to go a lot broader than that. Um, so it's a very exciting time to be in revenue management. It continues to be um, very dynamic, very complex, and such a great, um, mix of both that hardcore analytics and data and technology with really understanding operations and understanding your customer behavior. Um, really fun intersection of all those things. A um, little plug for, for my books that Heather mentioned at the beginning. They are available on Amazon. If you like what you've heard here and you want to dig a little bit deeper, um, one is laser focused on, um, on revenue management and pricing, kind of the modern practice. And then the other um, is brought more broadly about um, analytics, data, and um, technology, and how you best leverage those in a hospitality environment. Um, and with that, I am very much uh, looking forward to continuing the conversation with Heather. Okay. I'm back. <clears throat> She's back. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, Kelly and I talked about this part of the uh, session here and, you know, are we, did I just kind of come back on stage and are we going to sit on the couch? Well, what Kelly and I would really prefer to do is head to the bar. So I know it's early, but playing out that we are at a real conference and we want to have a conversation about all of this exciting, interesting stuff and this real evolution of revenue management that's happening at Short Term Rental. So we're at, we're going to take it to the bar. So mm -hmm. um, I'm switching out my coffee mm -hmm. for the martini glass. I love it. And um, um, we're I have call this a vodka tonic. Oh, very good. <laughs> oh. And um, I've set a timer so that we know when last call is. Oh, very good. <laughs> okay. Although I usually try not to let that stop me, Heather, but sometimes you just can't. <laughs> <laughs> I know we, we need to keep a schedule. Amy would be disappointed if we got off track on this for sure. 
<laughs> so, um, so you know, what we wanted to start with here, and I know you and I <clears throat> spent some time talking about this kind of in prep, but to make it more just discussion, um, you touched on airlines and the evolution, right? And and revenue management in other industries. And actually later today, there's a session that's called the kind of the comparison of hotel versus short-term rental. But um, we want to, you know, just talking more about how these things apply and the thinking, right? And so it's the philosophy and the concepts and then applying them to the operation or the business needs. And we know that varies obviously from industry to industry, but even within the space, you have different portfolio mixes. So, um, I know we talked about like the casino difference and the restaurant difference and um, how, how that applies, you know, and how you have to think of the operation. Yeah, I mean, th look, this is one of probably, and I started to allude to that at the end, the reason why I got into this, um, this discipline and why I love it so much is because, you know, you've got this sort of very mathematically driven need um, to, uh, you know, to understand demand, to optimize price, and there's all kinds of, you know, fun analytical techniques that underpin this. But if you don't understand the business to begin with and the operations of the business, um, then you're never going to be able to effectively revenue manage. It's so tied into operations um, that, you know, you really you have to understand that and you have to understand customer behavior. So, um, you know, and one of uh, so to me, one of the really interesting things about revenue management has always been thinking about, you know, you go through those necessary conditions. And how does it apply um, to industries that meet those necessary conditions, but who you know have like slightly different operations? So I know Heather, you you in your past you, at Kimpton, you guys talked a lot about restaurant revenue management with your restaurant portfolio. Yeah, so there are a few things I was thinking. You know, in restaurants, there's this component of time. So Brefney actually mentioned this yesterday: Rev Pass, revenue per available seat hour because um, the concept of throughput is important and that you can sell that table and those seats more than once, like in a night. Now, until we start selling homes by the hour, we know we're selling you know, the night, right? So that takes that kind of takes that time component away. Um, but she also talked about, you know, it's max, you don't want to put two people at the six top, right? And so, and how does that translate to short-term rental, right? And you think about, well, why does it matter if I have a party of eight in the four bedroom versus like a couple in a four bedroom home? Well, if they're paying the same amount, you know, uh, of the price, then it doesn't. But where it starts to matter, right, is if you're selling, um, you know, you're enhancing the stay and, and, and increasing your share of wallet by selling ski or lift tickets or kayak, right? And those ancillary add-ons that, you know, or golf, right? Everything that that person could additionally buy. Or the other reason it does matter if you have per person fees, but again, like translating to, okay, what, what do you do in your business? You know, yeah. how are you operating? So then you can apply, you know, where that's important for sure. I mean, what am I, yeah, you know, and it's just, you got to think about the drivers and that's a little bit like, you know, when we, t you talk about capacity in restaurant and how you most efficiently use that being so important. And like, one, I mean, I took the job at MGM because the casino problem, it just has this really interesting um, nuance to the traditional hotel problem. And that is that, you know, the most valuable customers in the rooms aren't paying a room rate at all because you get, you know, they're, they're your highest roller gamers and they're spending on the casino floor. So if you um, just optimize on room rate, that's a zero value room, you're gonna yield those customers out and the profitability of the whole property is gonna is gonna be impacted. And so here, if you if you just simply take the hotel theory and just stuff casinos into it, you end up like flipping the problem upside down and not driving. And so for years, casinos struggled um, to, to find an effective um, solution, analytical solution, uh, because of this, you know, this this issue. So again, it like comes down to understanding what are the characteristics of this business, where where is the revenue coming from? I mean, we use the example in short-term revenue. If it's coming all from the home, uh, then you you optimize the price on the home. But if you're getting ancillaries, the degree to which those are, or per person, like the degree to which that's important, changes the way you deal with the problem. If you ignore it, you're gonna you're not gonna you're not gonna optimize revenue. You're actually gonna well you're gonna impact negatively revenue. So um, so that's where it gets fun. Like you just you just need to know your problem. And sometimes it's the industry, and sometimes it's your the uniqueness of your business and 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 how that um, how that plays out. So I mean, it's just again, why wouldn't you want to be in revenue management? 
<laughs> as I was thinking, this actually like I feel like I woke up at like 4 a.m. like thinking about this story. Um, that just tying to the operation, right? And I know in the casino world, like you just talked about, right? This challenge of like you're dealing with what's important to kind of the the casino operators, right? And what guests are getting through the door and just kind of the balance of revenue management has to work hand in hand with operations. And, you know, to lead and make decisions that are best for the total business. So there's the story in restaurant revenue management. I feel like it's like urban legend at this point. It's the $60 lobster pot pie. Have you heard this story? Oh, I have not heard this story. Okay, tell me about the $60 lobster pot pie. Yeah, so the, the, the story is um, revenue management is new to this restaurant. And it's pretty upscale, you know, celebrity chef even maybe. I know there's some folks on the line that are probably totally checking me and know all the details of the story, but I'm gonna keep going. And so they're having a revenue meeting, right? A strategy meeting. They're talking about the, a concept in restaurant, right? Is menu engineering. What's selling? Are the What's the profit on the things that are selling? Can we actually change menu price? Should we take things off the menu, right? And, you know, driving this menu engineering, you know, four quadrant view, right? Of profitability. So this lobster pot pie is selling like crazy. And they're like, this, this is a popular dish. Like this is something like, let, we can raise the rate on this, right? So it goes from like $40 to 45. And the chef is like, you can't charge that much. You can't, like people won't pay, right? And he's like this operational kind of, it's, oh, that's too much. Well, it ends up that this thing continues to sell like crazy and it gets all the way to like $60 item on the menu. And so that was a good example of, yeah testing right and and pricing and realizing what the consumer is willing to pay but also having to navigate you know from a leadership perspective um those conversations right with the operations team anyway so that's yeah. uh i mean i love that story and you know i have one from uh from hotels a little bit similar i got it from um it's in my book actually from um uh, from neil fagan who was the um at the time was director of revenue at and i'm we go back way back with Neil too, don't we, Heather? But he uh, was the director of revenue for one of the Fairmont properties in City Center, and they had this great upsell program um, to upsell guests at the front desk into club rooms. And so they trained the front desk, and they had the whole plan, and they were going to do like you know the reduced rate upgrade at the front desk, and it was you know everyone was excited, and they launched it, and like no rooms were selling for the first two weeks. And they're like, we don't understand. This is a great, like we just, we nailed the pricing. We knew what the price sensitivity was. We have everybody trained. And they went down to the front desk and they were like, what's going on guys? And they're like, well, the problem is when the guests show up to check in, there aren't any clean rooms on the club floor. So we can't actually sell the rooms. Well, I mean, because those rooms were forecasted to be empty and they showed that in the PMS, housekeeping was cleaning them last. And so the front, you know, so there weren't any, so, the team and all of their rollout forgot to consider every aspect of the operation and as soon as they talked to the housekeeping leadership they started cleaning a couple of those rooms and you know changed the priority and then the room started selling and the whole property started driving revenue but it's like you've got to think through every tiny aspect of this issue it's so tied to operations but that's what makes it fun you know yeah the art and the science part of it yeah it's, yeah exactly and uh yeah. you know we got Anyway, I mean, it's just, it's, you get a lot of stories. Um, and I know we're, we're talking a lot about hotels and airlines, but you know, that was, this is the origins of revenue management. And that was, you know, back in the eighties and nineties, you know, the first couple of industries that really started taking advantage of it. Um, and so, you know, they, you've got these decades long practice from these folks, but um, you know, there's, uh, so we're, we're all sort of learning and adapting from there, but, uh, but, you know, it's really, um, What's been exciting is looking at industries like restaurants, like golf courses, like storage, like um, like short term rental that are saying, OK, I see, you know, I see this um, this opportunity, this technique. And how is it going to apply to my business um, and really starting to think through that discipline? It's been fun. Yeah. And um, the technology part is something that, you know, like you shared the timeline and talked about how technology really changed the game right and um in the hotel world um like the otas coming on the scene in the late 90s early 2000s and you know that journey of like mistakes that hotels made um is you know and book direct right like the the cost of acquisition and cindy estes green is going to talk tomorrow more about 
the cost of acquisition like concepts that have developed over the last several years around you know your decisions around channel mix um, but I know we wanted to talk a little bit about what are some of those mistakes like what you know what are things you just to share some examples of things to think about as property managers in short-term rental are deciding about how to market their properties you know if if you're not happy with how things are working on a certain channel um, and you decide just not to work or distribute through a certain channel, like the implications of that, or you know, going in eyes wide open to the landscape of how consumers shop and buy. Yeah, I think it's you know it, it to me um, when I think about how revenue management will evolve in short term rentals, you definitely want to look at. Um, how it's evolved in the past and try to, you know, avoid wherever possible. And I think the hotel industry, you know, well, I'm just going to go ahead and say it, but I feel like the hotel industry and revenue management over time kind of let things happen to them as opposed to keeping an eye on um, consumer trends and and disruptors in technology and disruptors in in competition. And so you know, end up ended up like a little bit back on their heels um, with some of this. And the distribution landscape is a perfect example. Um, so, you know, at first you got all these new channels that are driving demand, and then you wake up one day and go, ah, crap, they're too expensive. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna cut them off, you know, and um, and and not really, you know, like blunt instrument on either end, right? Like it's all or nothing. Um, but I think what you, what you know, the industry has learned quite painfully. Um, is you know these channels have a lot of power they drive a lot of demand and so you can't have a strategy that doesn't consider um, distribution partners you just have to be smart about how you apply them and i mean i got i actually was on the advantage end of that when i was um out in vegas uh one of our major partners got in a you know little bit of a tussle with one of the big um otas and pulled their inventory off for six weeks while they were debating uh, the contract and you would i mean we got every because you know here we're the biggest game in town now on this channel and like would not believe the lift that we got at that time and it continued after they came back on because um because the that that particular partner we stuck with them and they were you know we had we had better volume and it took a long time for the um for the other uh company in town to catch up so like just examples of, you know, sort of the power of this. And I don't know, Heather, you must have run into some of this in your past too, in revenue yeah. management. The, um, yeah, the turning on and off, right? A channel is uh, something that's talked about in short-term rental, right? Like, um, because in hotel, for those that don't know, there's something called LRA, last term availability, that actually is in many contracts where um, the big brands have committed to making sure if there is a unit left to sell that the channel has it as well as the direct book channel has it. That's a different, right? In short-term rental, that's not as consistent of a thing, this term LRA. So today it is possible, right, to flex channel turning on and off. The consideration though is, you know, those algorithms, those proprietary algorithms, right, that we all know for every channel, we know that is input to your page placement. So when you make choices about being on or off a channel, like you just talked about, right, it this they lost ground on, it's showed up now as a property that hadn't converted. So the conversion score is low. So if the conversion score is low, it's not gonna get the same page placement. Um, and whatever else is kind of in that algorithm, right? Like recent reviews and things like that. But um, yeah, I mean, for those of you that don't, that don't know, they're one of the major hotel chains pulled off. Um, you know, I think there was an attempt to try to have a plan of maybe spending more dollars to drive direct, but in the end, um, you know, that they ended up going back. And another kind of good story is if, you know, Marriott has, kind of even gone further with their Expedia partnership, like just sharing another example. Um, so they, they, um, they're, and th this is the article you just shared, right? Yeah, they're the exclusive yeah, yeah. provider of travel agents and wholesale rates, and they also power the vacations by Marriott where you can book a uh, airline, at, you know, on like the Marriott platform and still earn points. So it's, it's interesting, right? They've gone this kind of yeah. other direction. Well, I think that, you know, th here's a here's a good example of, you know, of of not just saying 
well, I mean, there's extremes, right? You either say, I'm not going to, you know, I don't want to deal. And obviously that didn't work or necessary evil, roll your eyes, wish you had more direct booking or figure out the best way to leverage these channels. And I think Marriott's done something really smart there. Um, the one of the biggest issues in hospitality, which again, I think, you know, is something a short term rental is going to be able to avoid is you, know, you give the well. Be careful. This is something to watch out for. <laughs> you give these you give these rates to wholesalers, um, you know, special discounted rates, and they get to mark them up. Um, and that's you know, it's a volume play in hotels. It always has been. You know, tour companies and uh, these volume bookers. Well, these days in this complex digital world, those discounted rates sneak out and erode your rate parity. And so. Um, so suddenly you find on some random channel somewhere the rate that you gave as a special private rate to one of these wholesalers. And that's a huge problem. I mean, you get in big trouble for violating rate parity contracts, but you're also diluting revenue. That rate should not be bookable in public. And so I think what Marriott has done there is said, well, look, I mean, we like this volume business, but if Expedia manages it, then they're, we're going to let them keep a handle on how those rates leak out. You can't access it unless you go through them. And so they've been able to solve a pretty big problem, leveraging the power of their partner. And this is, to me, you know, the example of you got to think creatively about how you use all this. It's not it's it's not easy. I mean, I don't know if I could say, you know, one piece of advice because I heard your alarm go off and it sounds like the bartender's about yeah, to pull her clothes off the table. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, to me, it's just being proactive, anticipate what's coming and think hard about how you're gonna use the data, use the channels, use the partners. Um, it is, uh, it's it's harder work, um, but that's the way that you avoid um, kind of any of these pitfalls that we've seen in the past with just being surprised by a new channel partner or, um, or uh, and you know, Brefney talked about this yesterday, incentivizing behavior that you don't mean. I mean, there's a whole bunch of examples besides just driving rate, driving occupancy that she talked about in her presentation that, um, you know, that can create uh, mismatched incentives. So I said a lot of words there. What I really mean to say is you got to think hard, you got to think carefully, you got to think strategic. <laughs> well, and that, this is our final thing, right, was to talk about like short term rental on this cusp of like disruption. I don't even know it's on the cusp. I mean, we're in it. Right. And like COVID has accelerated it. So like it is short term rental vacation rental ever had like their moment like this is it so what are we going to do with it you know it's kind of like the here we yeah. are and um and revenue management right it's like making that that shift to like property management to lodging hospitality like commercial strategy and revenue management is a core piece of that um i did want to mention uh vivek i don't think is speaking uh he is uh he is a senior position at expedia group overseeing the market maker product and revenue management for all of expedia group i know he goes way back with you kelly and we've known him i did get a chance to talk to him before this and he said you know anecdotally right he can't share like stats but they're in a position to see the lodging world and he said you know consumers now more than ever are more fluid and they're seeing the shopping behavior. So the idea that um, short-term rentals, vacation rentals may or may not compete with hotels, like it's just something to watch, right? Consumer behavior, where are they buying? How are they shopping? Just so much is changing. So just reinforces what you said, right? Like we have to be on the lookout and be prepared to change. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it just, I mean, it's a tremendous opportunity, but don't forget, you know, around the next corner is the next disruptor and nobody predicted this one and you know so uh so you know you got to stay on your game but i see it as a huge opportunity um you know just in terms of of uh you know the potential and the attention that the industry is getting right now so take advantage of it don't let it happen to you yeah i mean it's it's not a unique problem that last point we made about restaurants too like with having to play uber eats and doordash they're dealing with cost of acquisition right so like we can also learn by continuing to look at how other industries deal and, and find some inspiration there. For sure. I mean, the the industries that I've seen, you know, kind of stagnate are the ones that never look outside. Um, and you can see examples everywhere. So the fact that um, that the industry has welcomed people like you and me from, from hospitality, Heather, and um, allow us to kind of wrap our brains around this complicated problem and, you know, learn from each other, I think is uh, is just, it's it's a tremendous sign of, um, of potential. So just got to jump on it. Yeah, I you know, think we need have to some wrap. optimism in the midst of all the doom and gloom. Cheers right? to that! Right? <laughs> yes, indeed.
<laughs> <laughs> but um, I think uh, I'll close it out. Thanks again, Kelly, for joining. Oh, my for pleasure. <laughs> and uh, we'll my see you in later sessions as well. And for Thanks. sure. And you know, next time, uh, next time, hopefully, it'll be at the at the real bar. <laughs> real bar. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. See Thanks, you in, in about fifteen minutes.